May we listen to these words from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went into the city and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one after another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all fall away, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. A couple of years ago, Jen discovered an app called Lumosity that she fell in love with. Each day she logged into Lumosity, it would provide her with three, and only three short games to play that were designed to improve her memory. Jen had been looking for tools to try to help with her memory, and so this app seemed like it was going to be the perfect fit. Unfortunately, she was only able to use Lumosity for a couple of months until it was ruined for her. Well, I ruined it for her. I feel like there are two kinds of people in this world, those who have an incessant need to turn everything into a competition, and then those who are actively turned off by competition. I am the former, Jen is the latter. When I discovered that Jen was logging into Lumosity each day to play her three games, I was intrigued and I downloaded it and found out that I was given the same exact three games every day and thus the competition, at least in my mind, began. Each day I would ask her, have you played Lumosity games yet? What score did you get? Jen humored me for a while and then she finally broke down and said, Jacob, I literally just wanted to work on my memory a little bit each day. This was never meant to be a competition. It isn't fun anymore. And she has not opened Lumosity since. One of the most frequent themes in Scripture, and one that I rarely talk about, or that we rarely talk about, is humanity's faulty memory. In the Hebrew Scriptures, or what we call the Old Testament, the story of ancient Israel follows the same pattern again and again. The people engage in corrupt practices. They suffer as a result of their neglect of the ways of God. They call out to God for help. God rescues them only for the people to fall into the same corruption once again and start the cycle over. They can't seem to remember the importance of following God In the book of Deuteronomy, when the Israelites are on the cusp of entering what is known as the promised land, 
they refer to it as such. And, and God spends an entire chapter right before they enter exhorting them to remember the suffering of their past so that they do not become complacent. Take care that you do not forget the Lord your God by failing to keep His commandments, Moses instructs them. When you have eaten your fill and have built fine houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks have multiplied, then do not exalt yourself, forgetting the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Do not say to yourself, my power and the might of my own hand have gotten me this wealth. God knew that it was going to be easy for the people of Israel to forget everything that God had done for them, and sure enough, they do. I think that we can all relate to the feeling of being caught in a cycle where we look around and we wonder how our newspapers can be full of the same headlines that we have been struggling with decade after decade after decade. So it makes sense that when Jesus gathers with his disciples for what will turn out to be their final meal together, when he tries to share with them that he is going to be put to death, his mind is on doing something that will help the disciples remember him. Thankfully, the meal that Jesus is sharing with the twelve disciples that night is all about remembrance. As our scripture reading tonight informs us, what we know of as the Last Supper was actually a Passover meal, the same Passover that is observed by the Jewish community today. If you've ever been to a Passover celebration, then you know that there are a myriad of food and drink items that are all meant to serve as symbols in the retelling of God's miraculous rescue of the Israelites from their captivity in Egypt. At a Passover Seder, the host is responsible for explaining the significance of the meal that is being eaten. And on this night, Jesus takes the role of the host. During a Seder, a piece of matzah is consumed in recollection of the haste with which Israel left Egypt. There was not even time to wait for the bread to rise. Thus they eat matzah, unleavened bread, without any yeast. Jesus takes this bread and he explains that it now also represents his body. Not only is it a symbol of what God has done, it is now a symbol of what God is doing through Christ. At a Passover Seder, then and now, there are also four cups of wine. And the second cup, the one consumed after the matzah, is when the host would retell the story of the Exodus. And the host will recite prayers for the future redemption of Israel, which is supposed to match the past redemption of Israel from Egypt. A first century rabbi during the time of Jesus wrote that a common prayer during the Passover is this. On this night they were saved and on this night they will be saved. It was a recognition that God had saved the Israelites in the past and would save them again in the future. Well, Jesus takes this second cup and he adds to the story saying this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Jesus is providing a bold retelling of the Passover story in his role as the host. The redemption symbolized by the cup is not just a promise of a future redemption. That redemption has come now in this moment of the story right in front of their eyes through the person of Jesus. Just as God liberated the people of Israel a thousand years prior, God will liberate all people through Christ from anything that holds them down or holds them back. The story of the Exodus was so monumental that it was worth remembering and retelling again and again each year during the Passover. But now the unconditional love of Christ is equally worthy of remembrance again and again. Which is why in the other Gospels when Jesus passes the cup around, he tells them, anytime you drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. And so for the past 2,000 years, Christians all over the world throughout the centuries have gathered at tables and in sanctuaries and in homes to share a simple meal together of bread and juice to remember the love that leads to the cross. A love so strong, a love so divine that death could not keep Jesus 
in the tomb. We remember that God's love extends even to us. We remember that while we might try to keep people away from the table, God always beckons them forward. We remember that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God found in this meal. We remember that we are united with each and every person around us who is a beloved child of God. We remember. We remember because it is so easy to forget. Through Lent, we have been looking at a unique literary device employed by the writer of the Gospel of Mark. We're calling it Mark's Easter Eggs, where he will insert a story within a story. And here, Jesus' Last Supper comes right in the middle of two stories of the disciples classically forgetting everything that Jesus is about. In verse 18, Jesus tells his disciples as they're beginning to gather that one of them is going to betray him. They are astonished. They can't believe that any of them would ever do anything to harm their leader, their rabbi. After everything Jesus has taught them, after everything Jesus has done for them, how could anyone be so foolish as to harm him? Has he not taught them love? Love even for their enemies? The first readers of Mark's gospel would have already known, just like we already know, that the disciple that Jesus is referring to is Judas Iscariot. Now, it's easy to make Judas as something other than us, to externalize all the blame for Judas's betrayal on him and feel like there's no way that we would have ever done anything like that. Judas has become one of the most iconic villains in history. The person who committed treason against his greatest friend, who helped kill the greatest person the world has ever known. Of course, Judas could have done that. Of course, Judas could have stooped so low, but not us. The great villain of history, maybe, but certainly not us. Well, to help disabuse us of the notion that there's anything particularly reprehensible about Judas... After the Passover meal, Jesus makes another prediction. Not only will one of the twelve, one of his confidants, betray him, but actually every single one of them will fall away. Peter is horrified. Even if all fall away, I will not, he shouts. Judas Iscariot, yeah, no doubt that dude will fall away. John, yeah, don't like that guy either. Judas, Bartholomew, Simon the Zealot, Philip, Matthew, Thomas, James, Andrew, they might all fall away, but not me, Jesus. I'm your closest disciple. I'm your friend. I'm your most devoted follower, the one who knows you're the Messiah. There's no way I could ever fall away. Jesus breaks it to Peter that before the rooster crows twice the following morning, Peter will disown him three times. But Peter doubles down. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. But once again, like the first readers of the gospel, we know the end of the story. We know that Peter will fold like that. The moment someone asks if he's a follower of Jesus, he will deny ever knowing Jesus. Peter forgets to be loyal. He forgets Jesus' prediction. He forgets his commitment to Jesus that he will never fall away. He just forgets everything. But Jesus knows we forget. And so what comes right in the middle of Jesus telling his disciples that Judas is going to betray him and Peter's going to deny him It's the Passover meal. Jesus takes these two men who he knows are going to forget about him and he sits down with them and he shares a meal with them and he tells them that his blood is going to be poured out for their redemption. It doesn't matter that Judas is going to betray him or that Peter is going to fall away. It doesn't matter that every single person at that table is going to forget about Jesus. Jesus still eats with them and tells them that God's love is there to redeem them again and again and again. If only they will remember. So church, as we gather at this table on this special evening, just as Jesus and his disciples did so long ago, this is what we will be remembering. We will remember God's work of redemption is never finished. 
God can redeem the people of Israel from their captivity. And God can work through lovers of peace in the world today to redeem those who are caught in the crossfires of war and oppression even now. We will remember that God is always on the side of liberation. Liberation from violence, from discrimination. Liberation from the voices in our society that tell us that we are not good enough or not pretty enough or not wealthy enough or not productive enough or not interesting enough. We will remember that God is always ready to offer forgiveness whether that is forgiveness for Judas's betrayal or Peter's denial or forgiveness for anything we do that falls short of what God wants for us, forgiveness for failing to spend enough time with our families, forgiveness for being stuck in our selfishness, forgiveness for being mired in apathy, forgiveness for the callousness of our hearts, God doesn't extend that forgiveness to us once, but again and again and again. Peter might deny Jesus three times, but forgiveness will be extended each and every time. Grace upon grace upon grace. We will remember that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. In this church, neither our gender identity or our sexual orientation or our politics or our spiritual doubts or our age or race or past can ever prevent us from coming to this table. Why would we not be part of remembering God's love for us? So tonight we will remember that we are welcome here. I am welcome here and you are welcome here and each and every single one of us are welcome here. And tonight we will remember that our response to this great love is to love in return, to love as big and boldly and generously as we can ever imagine loving. This is Jesus' great commandment for us. To help us remember tonight, we're going to practice communion a little bit differently. The intimacy of our Maundy Thursday service allows us a little bit of time and space to linger here at the table tonight. Sometimes communion can feel a little bit anonymous. On communion Sundays, we come forward and we take the bread and we take the cup and we move on and go back to our seats and the next person comes up. Tonight, I'm hoping we can make it a little bit more personal That we can remember that this table isn't anonymous. God's love is for you specifically by name tonight. What I'm going to ask you to do might feel a little uncomfortable. But if you will allow yourself to be stretched a little bit, I think there's going to be emotional and spiritual payoff this evening. So if you were here for last year's Maundy Thursday service, it's going to be similar to that, but a little different. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. When you come forward for communion, I invite you to share just one sentence of where you need God's grace in your life. So you could say something like this. You could say, my daughter needs God's grace as she heals from a car accident. Or I need God's grace as I search for a new job. Or I need God's grace as I deal with the trauma of my past. You can be as vague or as specific as you would like. The first person who comes up is going to share with me where they need grace. And then I'm going to respond with these words. God gives you grace upon grace. And then I'm going to sit down. And the first person who spoke and came up is going to turn around. And the second person is going to come up. And you're going to introduce yourselves to each other so you know each other's name. And that second person is going to tell the first person where they need some grace in their life. And then the first person is going to tell the second one the same word. God gives you grace upon grace. First person is going to sit down. Second person is going to turn around. Introduce yourself to the third person. The third person is going to share where they need grace. And the second person will respond. God gives you grace upon grace. And we'll continue in a chain until the end. If you would prefer not to say anything about your life, you can just simply say, I am looking for God's grace. You can also stay in your seats and just raise your hand and myself or one of our deacons will come and serve you communion. If you are watching online tonight, put in the chat, where do you need grace tonight? I will personally respond to you in the chat. 
and let you know that tonight God offers you grace upon grace. So no matter what, may you remember this evening that God's grace is with you. In every moment and every day, grace upon grace. And if you find that hard to remember, don't worry. Next Sunday after Easter is already Communion Sunday. We'll do it again. And every month after that, may we never forget.